Well, this evening, our subject is Daniel's Blueprint of World History. And it's a subject that is one of uh, great interest in the sense that for many of us, um, when you come to the Bible, it's something that you, you've grown up with, you've read about, you've considered in Sunday school perhaps, or as, as it's been read around the, the family uh, home. And um, what is exciting about it is it gives us such a great breadth of information when it comes to what is going to take place in the future. So we're going to consider tonight this subject of, of this blueprint of world history. And we'd like to begin by just looking at a couple of things that God gives us in the Bible as indications of the power that he has in the word. So he tells us in Acts chapter 1, well actually it's the disciples who ask in Acts chapter 1, and at the, um, the, the sixth verse, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So the disciples, with the Lord Jesus Christ, wanted to know whether or not this was the time that they were going to see the kingdom restored to Israel. So what they were interested in was the events that were taking place in and around the nation of Israel and the coming kingdom that would take place. Well, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ responds to this, uh, this question that's put to him by the disciples. Um, when they ask this question, they are very anxious because it's the time of the Roman Empire. Uh, it's a time when, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ has been crucified. He has been raised back to life now. And they're in expectation that there's going to be a change that's going to take place to what is going to happen in the world. Now the Lord responds in verse 7, he says, To you, um, it, is not, it, it is not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father hath put in his power. And quite often, that's where we end reading. We just stop right there and say, all right, we're not supposed to know the times and the seasons, so that's the end of the story. But when you continue on reading, in the same context, he says, But you shall receive power after the, the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So God tells them that through the Holy Spirit, they would be given power to understand the times and the seasons. Now, he says elsewhere, no man knows the day or the hour, and that still stands true. But when it comes to the time and the season, that is certainly uh, something that is, is open for us to, um, to understand. That actually should be verse 8 there in Acts chapter 1. Now, this is something that goes back throughout, of course, um, history in the sense of um, what takes place in the Bible, because um, you have something going wrong here. Okay, never mind. Um, we have given to us throughout history um, the witness of the nation of Israel. So we'd just like to consider a couple of passages from Isaiah chapter 46, because God has, from the beginning of time, given indication as to what his plan is with the earth, given indication to his power and his ability to operate in the world around us, and has indicated it through the prophetic scriptures. So in Isaiah chapter 46, in verse 9, he says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all of my pleasure. So God informs us that from the beginning, he tells us the things that are going to happen in the future declaring the end from the beginning. So he tells us about the latter days in the Bible, and specifically in relation to what the disciples were asking about the nation of Israel. He says, Let all the nations be gathered together, let them be assembled, the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let, the, let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified, or let them hear and say, it is truth. So God gives a great challenge to the nations around, and he says, listen, let the nations around that are gathered together and the people that are assembled, let them prove whether or not they can show the former things. He says, I'm going to do this. He's going to bring forth his witnesses, and he says, it's a challenge. Either what I'm going to say is true, or it's not, or what you're going to say is true, or it's not. But God obviously declares in verse 11, what his witnesses are. He says, I, even I am Yahweh, beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, saith Yahweh, that I am God. And he is, of course, addressing the nation of Israel. 
So God sets out Israel as his witnesses that he is God and he declares the end from the beginning. And he gives us the blueprint of world history through the book of Daniel and other prophets that explain to us how this all works out. Well, in another prophet in Amos, in chapter 3, he says this is what he's going to do. And it's not just through the prophet Daniel, but there's other prophets where he will tell us things that are going to take place. So in Amos chapter 3 and at verse 6, he says, Will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? Or will a young lion cry out of his den if he hath taken nothing? And then he goes on to say, Shall the trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? So obviously if a trumpet sounds, it's an alarm. And he says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret to his servants, the prophets. So all the way through the Bible, God reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets, and he says he's not going to act without doing that. Now we'd like to turn to the book of Daniel, and that's going to be the focus for most of our consideration this evening, because Daniel has to do with the rise of the nation of Babylon, and the demise of the nation of Israel, the kingdom of Israel, for a period of time, and then its eventual restoration when the kingdom of men in its different phases comes to an end. And it all sort of begins in Daniel chapter 2, where, of course, Nebuchadnezzar has this great dream, and he calls before him all the wizards and soothsayers and so on and so forth to tell him what this dream is. He's a pretty smart guy because, you know, pretty well anybody um, could come up with a meaning to a dream. So he puts a test to them. And um, what he does is he says, okay, I want you to come, all you, you wise men of Babylon, you soothsayers and astrologers, um, and stand before me. So let's just take a look. It's Daniel chapter 1. We'll start in verse 1, or Daniel chapter 2. It's the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before him. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. And then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, uh, O king, live forever, tell thy servants the dream, and we will tell you the interpretation. We will show the interpretation. So, so that's kind of what they say. Well, if you can tell us what you dreamed... We can put a spin on this for you. We can put an interpretation on this for you. Well, of course, the king says, no, 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 no. Um, we're going to do a test. I want to know whether the interpretation that you're going to put on this is actually true or not, or whether it's just something you're going to make up. And so he puts a test on them, and he says, you have to first tell me what the dream was, and then tell me what your interpretation is, and that will be the litmus test to know whether or not you're actually telling the truth. Well, of course, we know the story that the Chaldeans are in a great strait because they cannot tell him what the dream was. And so, consequently, the king basically puts out a decree that all the wise men should be slain. And then, of course, Daniel and his friends hear about this. And um, Daniel prays to his God. If we come down to verse um, 17, Daniel um, said to the king that he's, he asked for some time to just, just think this over in verse 16. Daniel went in and desired the king that he would show, or give him time, that he would show the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, uh, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed God the God of heaven, and answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise, knowledge to them that know understanding. He reveals the deep and the secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. So Daniel basically thanks God that he's revealed to him uh, the meaning behind this dream and the dream itself. So what he does is he turns around and he then goes to the king and he tells the king that, you know, never fear, uh, in verse 28, there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. So Daniel is going to tell the king what his dream is and he's going to tell him what's going to happen and notice there it's in the latter days. So this is about the end times as they get called today. 
So Daniel basically relates to the king that he'd had this dream, and the dream was all about this great image that would come along, and basically um, it was it was cre or made basically in a certain way. It was a great image that was uh, was terrifying in the dream that he saw. So in verse thirty one, he says, "Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image." This great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee. The form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, and his feet part of iron and part of clay. So that's the dream that the king had seen of this great metallic image, and there would come a stone from heaven that would smite the image on the feet and crush them, and, and crush the whole thing, grind it to powder, and um, it would become a mountain and it would fill the whole earth. So that's the dream that is laid out before the king. And it's a nightmare. It's a terrifying dream that the king had had. So when it comes into understanding uh, what this is all about, Daniel says to the king that we do have the ability to do that, but of course it's not us, it's God. So in verse 36 he says, this is the dream. We will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand. He hath made thee ruler over all. So then he gives the interpretation. He says to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, you are this head of gold. So he says, you're represented, Nebuchadnezzar, by this head of gold. And there's going to be a succession of nations that are going to take place because God removes kings, as Daniel had said earlier in his prayer of thanksgiving, and he sets up kings. He brings kingdoms to pass and he removes kingdoms. So he identifies the king as being the head of gold. He is, of course, the, the Babylonian head of gold of this image. But he goes on to explain that there are other parts to this that as this dream goes through, if you look down at verse 39, he goes on to say, after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. So that's verse 39. And we know from world history that that following kingdom would be the Medes and the Persians. In fact, it's recorded in the book of Daniel how that the Babylonians would be overthrown by the Medes. And we'll look at that in just a moment. But then he says in verse 39, Then there's going to be a third kingdom of brass which shall bear rule over all the earth. And that, of course, would be the Greeks, also identified in the book of Daniel, that following the Medes and the Persians would come the Greeks in other visions that they saw. And finally, the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, for as much as iron breaks in pieces and subdues all things, as the iron that breaks in pieces, it shall break in pieces and bruise. So that last of the kingdoms would be the Roman Empire that, of course, would come out of the Greek Empire. So that's sort of Daniel's very brief blueprint as he gives concerning all of these nations, the last of which, of course, is the European system of today. And he says in verse 21, he says, Whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. And so it would have strength, but not like the, the former you know, kingdoms that went before it. So that this is kind of his blueprint. It's kind of a laid out structure of what's going to take place. And if you look in uh, verse 44, it's in the days of the kings of the toes, of the, the, uh, the feet and the toes, that the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it's going to stand forever. So if we relate that back to our beginning comments, when the disciples began their questioning of the Lord Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 1, they asked him, Lord, will you at this point in time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Well, Daniel's structure lays out that there's going to be a Babylonian empire, a Medo-Persian empire, a Greek empire, a Roman empire, and then this Roman sort of European empire of the latter days. And during that period that's when God will set up his kingdom. So it wouldn't be for many, many days into the future. And that's the grand structure that's given to us in the book of Daniel. We'll come over to Daniel chapter 7, because Daniel 7 builds upon this idea. Now, chapter 2 is more or less a, a static dream, you could say in many ways. It's a, an image that stands there. The only animation, really, is when you have the stone that comes and smites the image on the feet and 
breaks it to powder and becomes a, a mountain that fills the whole earth, which is this kingdom age. So we have this the span of time from the time of Daniel right the way through to the kingdom of God. There would be these five phases that this, this whole system would go through. But in Daniel chapter 7, we have not the king this time having a dream, but the prophet Daniel who has a dream. So he is dreaming, and he is seeing basically uh, this dream that takes place in, in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 1. We read, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed, and he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matter. So Daniel now sees a dream, and he records it. And Daniel spake and said, I saw in my visions by night, and behold, there's this great tempest, four winds of the heaven strive upon this great sea. So that's what Daniel is looking at, is the four winds of heaven striving upon this great sea. And before we get into the detail of the narrative, we're, we're actually given a few clues to understand what this whole uh, vision is about. Because we're told basically about this great sea in Daniel chapter 7 verse 2 when he saw the, the, the four winds upon the great sea.
In Daniel chapter 7, in verse 4, we read there, I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made to stand upon its feet as a man, and a man's heart is given unto it. So we see that there's a change that's going to take place, a change in the nature of this lion. It goes from being a winged lion to a lion that has a man's heart. And of course, Jeremiah chapter 4, in verse 7, we read there about the lion coming up from his thicket, the destroyer of the Gentiles is, is on his way. He's gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate, and thy city shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. Well, Jeremiah also equates another little aspect of this. This is a man's heart that's given to it. So we ask the question, well, what exactly does that mean? Well, in Jeremiah chapter 10, we're told there, chapter 7, sorry, in, in verse 10, we're told there basically what this is all about, what this, this sort of symbology is is all about. Sorry, I got the wrong one there. It's 17. 17 verse, I knew there was a 10 and a 7, whatever. It's actually verse 9. 17 verse 9, he says, The heart, and this is the heart of man, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But God says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins to give to every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So the fact that it has a man's heart given to us tells us that it's going to be a terrible and a wicked system, uh, desperately wicked, because that's the way man's heart is described here in Jeremiah 17 in verse 9. When you look at this idea then of a winged lion, and you think of the, the city of Babylon, and, and this is the Ishtar gates, an artist's depiction of those, and you say, well, this is the time period where Daniel would have been there. He would have walked by these gates, and in fact, he would have seen on these gates, uh, as he walked in, a mural on the wall um, of a winged lion. This was actually in the Toronto Museum not too long ago, a couple of years back. And um, there is the lion. And you can see there, if you can make it out, the depiction of the wings that are on this, uh, on this lion. So they're basically right in this area here. There are wings that adorn this lion. It's not just a mane, but there are wings. So when you look at this time period, this is a very peculiar characteristic that is given to this lion. And of course, we know that the kingdom of Babylon existed because you have the Ishtar Gate. We know that Nebuchadnezzar existed because if you go to a place like Chicago today, you can go to the Museum of the Orient there that's on the University of Chicago campus, and you can see the stone. It's a brick from Babylon, the Great. Uh, in Iraq with the inscription that has Nebuchadnezzar's name right on it. So it's obviously he's identified um, in this whole picture. But it was a heart of wickedness. That's the characteristic of this lion. And so what we find there then, of course, is that in Second Chronicles chapter 36, that this king that would come, this Nebuchadnezzar would come, and he would destroy the nation of Israel. So this is just the record of what it says. Uh, 2 Chronicles 36 and verse 17, He brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young man with a sword in the house of their sanctuary. He had no compassion on the young man or maiden, old man, or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand. And all the vessels of the house of God, small and great, the treasures of the house of Yahweh, the treasures of the king and of the princes, all these were brought. he brought to the Babylon. And they burnt the house of God, break down the wall of Jerusalem, burn all the palace thereof with fire, destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof, and them that escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were made servants unto him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. Right? So there you have kind of the bookends of, of the captivity in Babylon's time, is that from the beginning of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar would come along, he would destroy Israel, he would take the people captive, and the people would be captive until the time period when the first king of Persia would come along. Now it's interesting that Jeremiah also picks up on this. Remember, it's not just Daniel, but I, uh, Amos had said that surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. And he'd actually given the time period in Jeremiah chapter 25, when he says in verse 11, This whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. And it shall come to pass, when seventy years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith Yahweh, for their iniquity, and the land of the Chaldeans will I make into a perpetual desolation. So that's what Jeremiah said. 
And if you just turn your Bible to Jeremiah or Daniel chapter 9, Daniel, in the first year of the Medes and the Persians who take over, as we'll see in a moment, he says there in verse 2, in the first year of Darius' Darius's reign, uh, I, Daniel, understood by books, and he's talking about Jeremiah here, the passage in front of you, I understood by books the number of the years where the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So at that point in time, Daniel then bursts into prayer to God to basically save his people from this, this great Babylonian invasion. So that's the end of the kingdom of Babylon. So what we find out is, back in Daniel chapter 7, we have here another beast that will come along. So first of all was the lion with the two wings, the Assyrio-Babylonian lion that would take Israel captive. And then we have, in verse 5 of Daniel 7, another beast, a second, and this one is described like to a bear. And it raised up itself on one side, it had three ribs in its mouth between the teeth of it, and they said unto, or thus unto it, Arise and devour much flesh. So the Babylonian Empire would be destroyed, and the Medo-Persian Empire would come along. And this, of course, was actually picked up by Isaiah the prophet, who also spoke about this, and talked about the king of Babylon. And he says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? And he's addressing the king of Babylon in, in the context there, um, which are cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And God says, No, you won't. Uh, you shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit, which is the grave, of course. Thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and as the remnant of those that are slain, thrust through with the sword, that go down to the stones of the pit, a carcass trodden under feet. So that is how the king of Babylon is going to die, according to the words of Isaiah, some 200 years before this event would take place. Because like Isaiah said, or Amos said, the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. So if you've got Daniel open, just turn back to chapter 5, because this is the time period where there is a change of empires. It's the time period of Belshazzar. Belshazzar is the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. His father is Nabonidus, and um, he basically is, is kind of the regent, co-regent with his father at this point in time. He's ruling in the city of Babylon while his father is off elsewhere. And it's in Daniel chapter 5 that we read that Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. And Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines, concubines might drink therein. So they brought the golden vessels that were taken out to the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, so that they could have this great drunken feast using the vessels from the temple. And so they praised, uh, they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, uh, brass, iron, wood, and stone, which of course is fairly ironic because most of that is the, the pieces out of this, this great image. Well, of course, in the middle of this great feast, um, the writing comes upon the wall. And, of course, this is the, the, the very famous uh, situation where Belshazzar is, uh, is enjoying this great drunken feast when it says the same hour, in verse 5, came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick, which is the lampstand taken from the, the temple in Jerusalem, upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. So, miraculously, this hand appears and writes in Hebrew on the wall, and, of course, um, Daniel is called, as the narrative goes on, to give the interpretation, because they can't even read the writing there, let alone figure out what it all means. But notice that it all has to do with the nation of Israel. Remember that the Lord Jesus Christ was asked by the disciples, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? What was the, the issue here with Belshazzar? Well, he took the vessels that were taken from the kingdom of Israel, from the temple, and they're drinking wine in them. 
And Daniel had understood by books that the time period had come that Israel's uh, uh, restoration must take place. So he's called forward, and in verse 25, he gives the interpretation. He says, this is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, God hath numbered thy kingdom, and finished it. Take all thou art weighed in the balances, and art found wanting. And Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and to the Persians which of course had already been seen in the visions that he had in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, and of course back in Daniel chapter 2. And so the Medes and the Persians then would come along that night and they would basically overtake this whole empire. The Medo-Persian Empire was in the northeastern area of, of the Babylonian Empire. It was one of the thirds of that empire. It was made up of a cosmopolitan people. You had Medes, who had the, uh, the rounded uh, um, helmet there, and the Persians with the more square brush-looking thing on their heads, right? So the Medo-Persians, who basically were a multicultural society that worked together. They were multicultural because Cyrus was the son of the Median uh, king's daughter and the Persian king's son. So like you had this, this intermarriage between the two that pulled them together. Like most great rebellions, it began over taxes, just kind of like the, the whole uh, uh, American Revolution began. Um, taxation without representation. They got sick of this, so they decided they would overthrow the government, which is exactly what they did. So Cyrus and Darius joined forces, the Medes and the Persians together, marched upon Babylon, and after a series of battles, ended up at the city. And uh, Cyrus had this great plan to surround the city, and the Babylonians thought this was the funniest thing ever because Cyrus built this great big ditch all the way around the city. And the Babylonians had a river running through the city, so they had plenty of water, and they had 20 years supply of food, and the city was impregnable. So they, they laughed at Daniel or at, at um, Cyrus as he had come against the city, and that's chapter 5. The feast is really the time of celebration that our city is impregnable and nobody can, can come into the city. But what's interesting, of course, is God will do nothing, but he reveals his secrets to the servants, the prophets. So back in Isaiah 45, some 200 years earlier, God had said how Babylon would be destroyed. He says in verse 1 of chapter 45, I will loose the loins of kings, open before him the two leave gates, the gates shall not be shut. So the gates to the river that usually would protect it would be left open at this point in time. I will go before thee, make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass, cut in sunder the bars of iron, and I will give thee the treasures of darkness, the, the hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I am the Lord, which call thee by thy name, I am the God of Israel. And so when you look at this, you see that this was exactly what take, took place. Jeremiah had also recorded some 70 years earlier how this would happen in chapter 51. He says, O thou that dwellest upon many waters, which is addressing Babylon, abundant in treasures, thine end is come, and thy measures of, of covetousness. Uh, verse 36, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will plead thy cause and take vengeance upon thee, for I will dry up her sea and make her springs dry. He's going to bring a drought upon her waters. So he will break the gates, he will loose the loins of kings, and it says, of course, that he would dry up the waters. So in Daniel chapter 5, when Belshazzar had seen this great uh, writing upon the wall talking about loosing the loins of kings, um, what of course happened was that, that Belshazzar, his knees were knocking together. As it tells you there, he says, um, um, before Daniel's call before him, uh, when the, the hand wrote in verse 5 upon the wall, verse 6, the king's countenance was changed, his thoughts troubled him, the, so the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against the other. So he's knocking his knees together in fear of what this is all about. But the gates also would be opened and the rivers would be dried up. So Cyrus, who everybody laughed at, moved all his forces on the inside of this moat, this siege ditch that he built all the way around the city. And this night, when this great feast is going on, he diverts the waters of the Euphrates, so that instead of running through the city, they run around the city, and he's able to bring his forces and march up the riverbed into the city, where the gates had been left over, 
and consequently he overcame the city exactly according to the words that had been uttered in Isaiah and in Jeremiah. And so it was that Belshazzar would be destroyed. That night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain, you read in Daniel 5 verse 30, and Darius the Mede took the kingdom being about three score and two years old, or as one version would put it, he received the kingdom. So Darius is handed the kingdom by his uh, nephew Cyrus who goes off to defeat the rest of the forces of Nabonidus and of the Babylonians and the end of Babylon is of course secured. And so the Persians then would take over and we enter the next phase of this whole thing which is the Persian Empire uh, depicted by the bear that's raised up on one side, the Medo-Persian, the Persian side being stronger and having three ribs in its mouth the three provinces um, that Rome based, or that, that Babylon was divided into, or the three areas that Babylon was divided into, it devoured all of them. And of course, as much uh, evidence of, of this empire of, of Cyrus today, you can go to Pasigrad in, uh, in Iran. Um, this is the audience hall of Cyrus's capital. There's the great palace at Persopolis. This is no small city. This is a massive complex. It was a great empire and a huge, huge place. You've got the gate of the nations here, and um, there's a, a depiction of what this would have looked like, kind of a reconstruction. It was indeed a massive structure. If you ever have the opportunity to go to uh, Chicago, I would highly recommend you spend a, an afternoon at the Museum of the Orient, the Oriental Institute. I took Chafin there back when he had a lot more hair and he was a little younger. And, um, and that's basically, you can see the size of this bull, this winged bull of Persopolis, or the horse, sorry, of Persopolis. This is the massiveness of this whole thing. In fact, if you were at the Bible exhibition and we saw the Taylor prison, the Sennacherib prison, one of those prisms is in Israel, one of them is in the British Museum, and one of them sits in Chicago because they went and they uh, excavated this whole area. Cyrus, of course, is a very historical figure. Um, I actually was working with somebody the other day and, um, you know, she described where she was from. The, the person I was working with said, you know, asked her where she was from. And she said, well, I'm actually a Persian. And he said, oh, that's a, a nice way of saying you're Iranian. And she says, no, I'm a Persian. And uh, he said, oh, is that like the Shah of Persia? And she said, not really. And I said, is that like Cyrus the Great? And she said, absolutely. So they identify themselves more with the historical Persia, not with the fanatical state that's there today. And, of course, we have the Cyrus Cylinder, which we had on display as well. Um, and this is what it says. Uh, I'm just going to pick a couple of pieces out. I am Cyrus, king of the universe, the great king, because of course he subdued the whole known world at the time. Gives you basically uh, a rundown of, uh, of who he was. And basically he went to Babylon and founded his sovereign residence within the palace amid celebration and rejoicing. My vast troops are marching peaceably in Babylon. So he took it over without much of a fight. And um, he says he brought to safety the city of Babylon and all its sanctuaries. And he goes on to say that he set people free. I freed them from their bonds. I sent them back to their places. Um, and the gods also he sent back to their places and whose shrines had been dilapidated. The gods who lived therein made permanent sanctuaries for them. So he gave commandments for them to go back. I collected all the people and returned them to their settlements and their gods, which Nabonidus, to the fury of the Lord of gods, had brought into Shushan or Shushan of the palace. So I returned them unharmed to their cells. So he says, what I did was, I took all the religious gods and vessels and, and the peoples, and I sent them back to their lands. Well, that's what happened at the end of the kingdom of uh, Babylon. And in Ezra, of course, we read about this, because this is the time period of Ezra and Nehemiah, the first year of Cyrus the Persian, who had the cylinder struck, uh, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, because it had already been uh, uh, spoken about ahead of time. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus the Persian, and he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and he told them basically to go back and rebuild the house of Jerusalem, which was the house of the God of the Hebrews, which is in Judah, and anybody who wanted to go was allowed to go, and of course they took with them there the vessels of silver and gold and so on and so forth. And, of course, that's the story of Ezra and Nehemiah. Nehemiah was in Shushan, the palace. This is also from, uh, from um, uh, a picture, actually, that's from the, the museum down in, uh, in Chicago. And uh, he was in Shushan, the palace, and the decree went out that they would go back to the land. So that was 
the kingdom of the Persians and the Medes who would come along and restore Israel back to the land, but not the kingdom. Ezekiel had told the king, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it until he come whose right it is, and I will give it to him. So there has never been a kingdom in Israel again, although there has been a Jewish state a couple of times. So in Daniel chapter 7 then, when we, we look at this great structure, we're told there, behold, lo, another, like a leopard, had uh, on the back of it four wings of a fowl. Beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. So the fourth or third beast that comes up, basically, out of the sea is a very peculiar-looking creature. It's a leopard with four heads and four wings, all of which have some meaning. Now, we don't have time to get into all of the detail of it, but, of course, this is the following empire which is the empire of the Macedonians, and of course the Greeks, as they would succeed it. Uh, Philip of Macedon sort of being the one who pulled things together, and his son, of course, would be um, Alexander the Great. This was the empire of Philip, uh, the kingdom of Philip of Macedon. That's what it looks like there. Uh, he incorporated Greece and Thrace and, and uh, some of the other places, Illyria, uh, into his empire. And of course, he's right on the border of the Persian Empire. And this, of course, didn't go over very well with the, the Persians, who really wanted to overrun this whole area. So along comes his son, and again, it all begins with a tax revolt. Uh, they were fed up of being taxed by the Persians, who put a huge taxation on them to support their opulent lifestyle. And so Alexander uh, the Great uh, comes along, and uh, here he is depicted with his horse, Bucephalus. Um, and he would be the young man... He would go out and at a very early age, uh, in fact, uh, one of the, uh, the traders had brought this, this, this great horse, Bucephalus, to his father, and it was untamable. And so Alexander um, said to his father, if I tame this horse, can I have it? And his father said, you can sure have it because nobody else can get anywhere near it. And Alexander, of course, took the horse, turned it around because it was afraid of his shadow, as the story goes, and was able to hop onto the horse and to ride it, and that became his horse, with which he set out then a uh, few years after his father had been murdered, um, believably by um, his own kin. Um, but uh, he went out and, and subdued the Persians. And so here we have the first of the major battles, the Battle of Issus in 333 BC in what is today modern-day Turkey, where Alexander the Great is depicted, and this is actually a mosaic off of the wall of um, Pompeii, it was destroyed with the, uh, the great volcano, and it was preserved. And so there we have Alexander the Great depicted uh, fighting against Darius the Persian, Darius the Third of the Persians. And, of course, he was no match for the great phalanx of the, the Greeks, who would come with this great sort of battery of, of these pikes and um, shush kebab anybody in their, in their way. And they would just keep dropping these great big spears down. And, and at that point in time, it was like a, it's like the tank of the day. Nobody could kind of fight against it. It was a new form of warfare, and they hadn't figured out what to do with it yet. And so, of course, he routed Darius III, who fled and eventually was murdered by his own men um, as he fled. So Daniel continued, or Alexander the Great continued his conquests in the year 331 B.C., he enters into the city of Babylon, which was still standing at the time, although a bit of a ruin. And um, in 330 BC, he made it all the way to Persopolis and burnt it to the ground uh, because the Persians years ago had come under Xerxes and had burnt down um, one of the, the Greek cities to the ground. So they figured, well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So they burnt Persopolis to the ground. And it would only be a, a short while later that Daniel would die in 323 BC in Babylon. It's believed that he died of alcohol poisoning or somebody poisoned the alcohol uh, that he was drinking. But as the Proverbs tell us in chapter 31, verse 4, it is not for kings, O Lemuel, to drink strong drink. So just take a page out of that, young men. Um, you know, strong drink and a strong man like, like Alexander the Great, who conquered the entire world, met his end uh, basically because he drank too much. And that was, that was the end of Alexander the Great. So his empire was divided into his, between his four generals, and this is also picked up in the story of, uh, of the, um, Daniel chapter 8, which we don't have time to get into tonight. We're just kind of looking at the overview. But that's why there are four heads and four wings on this peculiar-looking leopard, if you remember. It had four heads because the empire was divided into four amongst his four generals 
to the four wings or the four corners of the earth. And out of one of these corners would come up this, this last of the beasts. He says, I, I saw, he says, in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and breaking pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was different from all the other beasts which were before it. And this peculiar looking beast has ten horns. So helpful in this is the fact that it's got iron teeth, which identify it with the iron legs of the image, which, of course, when you look at the succession of empires, we just have to turn to even secular world history will tell you it was the Babylonians, then it was the Medes and the Persians, then it was the Greeks, and they were followed, of course, by the Romans, who are depicted as the iron legs or this terrible looking uh, scary fourth beast. Well, Rome, of course, came out of the north and the, the western side of the empire. And, of course, we're all familiar with probably the first of the emperors, uh, a guy named Julius Caesar, who ruled simultaneously at one point with Gaius Pompeius, as we know as Pompey, and another little-known guy named Marcus Licinius Crassus. Uh, Crassus really didn't do a whole lot, you know, two's company but three's a crowd. So he was kind of out of the way fairly quickly. And it became a bit of a contest between Pompey and Julius Caesar. Well, Pompey um, was in charge of, of the army and went down through the land of Israel. And he was the one who defeated the Maccabees in the year 63 BC. And, of course, he would establish himself as a bit of a rival to Caesar. But, of course, that didn't last overly very long. And Pompey eventually met his end. I believe he was given the choice of putting a sword in himself, which I think he did. Um, it's kind of a very sordid period of history, but of course Julius Caesar himself didn't make it very far because Marcus Junius Brutus, as we know, A2 Brutus, put a sword in his back and that was the end of Julius Caesar. So he was uh, taken over by this young man, Gaius Octavius, uh, who he had adopted as his son, basically. He didn't have a son of his own. And a second triumvirate was, was struck where there was three rulers over the Roman Empire, because it was so big, that lasted for about a decade. Um, there was Marcus Lepidus, was the other one, and Marcus Antonius, which you may remember, a little bit more familiar, Mark Antony, right? So Mark Antony and Octavian are the two that really jostle for power, and Lepidus is kind of like really not a whole big picture in this. The third guy always tends to be, you know, not much, but he, he disappears. So, of course, we know the story of, of Mark Antony and um, Cleopatra. She was the last of the Greek Ptolemaic rulers of Egypt, and they united forces against Octavian, but were defeated at the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, where, of course, we know the famous story that uh, Mark Antony fell on a sword, and uh, Cleopatra had the viper, or the asp, which she killed herself, committed suicide by being bitten by it. Um, interestingly, just as a sub-note, Herod the Great had sided with Mark Antony. And the Antonio Fortress in Jerusalem is named after Mark Antony because that was Herod's champion. Um, so Herod had to quickly change sides after this. Octavian, though, is somebody that you're actually familiar with because he took on the name Caesar Augustus, which is the one that we read of in Luke chapter 2, verse 1. It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus, who is the same guy Octavian, that all the world should be taxed. So it's during his reign that Mary and Joseph go down to Bethlehem, and, of course, the taxation takes place, and then they would later go on uh, down to Egypt. So the Roman Empire, then, rules over the whole world after defeating Cleopatra and the Greeks. It's the end of the Greek Empire. And, of course, they would also be the ones that would crucify the Lord Jesus Christ at the hands of this man, uh, Pilate. And if you go to Israel today, you can go to the Jerusalem Museum or the Israel Museum, and you can see the Pilate stone, the, the marker there that has his name right in it, uh, Pilate. And uh, up in Caesarea Maritime on the coast is where it is. And so the destruction of this whole uh, second restoration of Jerusalem is foretold for us in um, Luke chapter 21. And we have it in verse 5. As some spake of the temple, how it was adorned, the goodly stones and gift, he said, as for these things which you see, this is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking, he says, behold, the days will come. There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So this, this change of empires 
would mean that Jerusalem, by the time of AD 70, as the Lord predicted here, would be destroyed. And Jerusalem would be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles um, would basically be fulfilled. But we do have one more little detail we just want to key on for a moment, and that is that this fourth beast has another little phase to it that, that just gets brought up. Now, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because it really could be a whole other class in itself. But in Daniel chapter 7, in verse 8, Daniel says, Look, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. So he says, Another horn came up. Um, before there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, this horn, there were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouse speaking great things. So this blaspheming little horn that would come up, basically, um, would last until the Lord Jesus Christ returns, and it would also make war against the saints. So we read in, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 20, that horn had eyes and a mouth, it spake great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows, and he says, I beheld the same horn made war with the saints and prevails against them. So the system would arise that would persecute the saints, the believers, the, the Christians through the ages. And of course, you only have to look at history, uh, church history, to see the great atrocities that were, were done throughout the ages. It also comes up in the book of Revelation, um, basically about the idea of making merry and sending gifts one to another because of the great slaughter that had taken place. And this is just one example, the massacre of the Huguenots, Bible believers, uh, on St. Bartholomew's Day, where they were all put to the sword when the Roman Catholic system basically had its, its full power in Europe and many, many Christians were persecuted, uh, Spanish Inquisition and the Inquisitions throughout Europe and so on and so forth. So another period of history, uh, really that, that, that Holy Roman Empire that would come into place and would persecute many of, of the people of God throughout the ages. But this whole thing would continue on for a period of time. So the Roman Empire would go through several phases and uh, would basically exist until, we're told, the Ancient of Days would come. So when we, we look at this little horn, we read that the horn had eyes and a mouth, he speaks great things, he prevails against them, until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Now that brings us back to where we started. Remember the Apostle that asked the Lord Jesus Christ, Will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And Daniel had this little clue in his, prof in his prophecy that the persecution of the Christians, basically, or, or of specifically believers, would take place for a period of time. They would be under the boot of the system, this, this successor to the Roman Empire, the Roman Catholic system, until this time period comes along when judgment is then given to the saints of the Most High, and the time comes that the saints possess the kingdom. So it brings us right up concurrent with our time period of today. So we just step back and, and summarize what we've looked at in, in a bit of a whirlwind tour. I mean, don't forget this is blueprint of world history. You've got 2,600 years to cram into 60 minutes. So, I mean, it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of history that kind of rolls through. But I hope you've seen here how that basically what we're looking at is a system of things where it's described in Daniel 2 as this great image. But Daniel chapter 7 gives us more detail where it talks about these, these four beasts or five phases that would come along. And of course, as you roll through that, we have the first of these phases is the Babylonian phase, which would go from around the year 606 or 600, um, right the way through to around um, the time period of the Medes and the Persians. And the Medes and the Persians would last, basically, after that, that 530 years before Christ, roughly to around 333 BC. They are equated with the bear of Daniel 7 and the chest and arms of silver of Daniel chapter 2. In 333 BC, along would come Alexander the Great, uh, who was the, the first of the Greeks, basically, the great Greek kings or emperors. And he's signified by the belly and thighs of brass in Daniel chapter 2, and the, the four-headed leopard in Daniel chapter 7, because, of course, his kingdom would be quickly divided into four parts. And that would last until approximately 67 uh, BC, before Christ, when the Roman Empire would finally emerge, and Julius Caesar and Pompey and the others that we looked at would come along, 
and they would unseat the Greeks eventually at the hands of Mark Antony, and they would establish the <coughs> Roman Empire that is described in Daniel 2 as the legs of iron, and in Daniel chapter 7 as this fourth beast that's dreadful and terrible, and it would develop eventually, and we haven't had time to really look at this, into the nations of Europe as we see today. So that's the blueprint that God lays out of all of world history. And it's amazing, friends and, and, and young people and, and brethren and sisters, that when you, when you follow this through, the accuracy of this as piece by piece by piece has basically been laid out, um, so much so that some of the critics of the Bible have said, well, chapters like Daniel chapter 11 had to be written after the fact, because the play-by-play the -play -play that we didn't get into, the detail uh, between all the players is so detailed that they must have been recorded afterwards and added into the record, which, of course, we know isn't true, um, but they just can't reconcile themselves with this. But the point is this, is that God has told the end from the beginning. And he told us in the beginning that that's what he was going to do in Isaiah. He picks it up in Jeremiah, he picks it up in Daniel, he's going to show the king what shall be in the latter days. So it's in the days of these kings in Daniel chapter 2, the two kingdoms, the successor empire to the Roman Empire, that everything is going to change. We read in Daniel chapter 2, verse 34, Thou sawest until something else took place here. A stone was cut without hands, which smote the image upon his feet, that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold, broken in pieces together, and became like chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away, and no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole of the earth. So this is the time period, the time and the season in which we live. When all those empires are now their history, we've been talking about history, they've come and they've gone. We live in the time period of the toes, when all that we're waiting for is a stone to come along and smite the image upon the feet. But what is that stone all about? Well, we're told in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, it's in the days of these kings that the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it is going to stand forever. That's what Daniel says, that in the days of these kings, the God of heaven is going to destroy the kingdom of men that suppress the kingdom of Israel. And what the disciples asked in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? It wouldn't be at that time, but if you just have a look at Acts chapter 3, he tells him there that it would be further on. Acts chapter 3 we read there in verse 19, Repent therefore, be converted, that your sins be blotted out, when the time of refreshing, or the restitution, or restoration, shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of the restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. And when you step back and you look at, there's the whole blueprint of world history. The world empires have subdued the nation of Israel, have kept it basically underfoot for thousands of years. And yet in the past few years, 1948, the state of Israel comes into being. 1967, the city of Jerusalem that was trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, is then restored back to Israel. It's in the days of these kings, says Daniel, that the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom. And that's, of course, what Christians pray for all the time. It's the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. That's what Daniel was looking forward to. That's what the Apostle Peter says is going to take place, is that when the restitution of all things happen, he's going to send the Lord Jesus Christ, whom the heavens must receive until these things are restored. So we live in a time period when the kingdom of men, in all its ugliness, is going to be destroyed. And Daniel tells us in chapter 7, in verse 11, I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain, 
his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. The kingdom of men is about to be destroyed, and in its place, as we read from the beginning of, of time throughout the Bible, there is going to be another kingdom that is going to be installed. And this, of course, is going to be the kingdom of God, which is going to be put on earth. So when we consider what we have, this, this whole idea that in the days of these kings, the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And that kingdom, basically, is going to overrun all these other kingdoms. That's what Isaiah, who prophesied of the fall of Babylon, of Cyrus the Great coming, he wrote about it as well when he wrote in Isaiah chapter 2, it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it and many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob for he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven in Jerusalem, in Mount Zion, where the temple will be built and where the kingdom of God will be established and administered from. So friends and young people, when we look at this and we say, okay, there's world history laid out like a blueprint. Back from the time of Daniel, the Babylonians would come along, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, and then finally the Romans until this all gets wrapped away. We know that we live in the very end of time. When you look at the Bible, it's not a book of fairy tales. The Apostle Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 to 18, he says, look, we have not followed fairy tales, cunningly devised fables. This isn't like Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, with all these imaginary creatures running around. This is reality. This is history. This is fact. He says, we didn't follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, we were there, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were in with him in the Holy Mount. So they were there the Mount of Transfiguration with the Lord Jesus Christ, and they said we were eyewitnesses of this. But he goes on to say, you know, we weren't there, but we have something else. He says we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in the dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So we have the prophetic word, although we were not there with him in the mount to listen to the voice of the Lord uh, calling down, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The testimony of prophecy stands, says Peter, as a light that shines in a dark place, as a reminder to us, as a witness to us that God is on his throne and that he will bring about his kingdom that we've all been praying for since we were little children. And so we close with the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5. When you look at the world around you and you see all the events that are taking place, we don't need to, to lose heart. We need to realize that we are living on the knife edge of the kingdom at the time when this is all about to take place. He says in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 1, Of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. And it will to most of the world around us. They'll be taken completely unaware. They'll have no idea what's going on when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Because the Bible says he's going to return and we know we live in that time and season. But he says, you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are the children of light, the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. So if we've taken sort of a, a whirlwind tour through world history, using the blueprint of the Bible to, to sort of guide us and to see that, look, all of these things and all the detail, much more detail than we were able to even talk about today, is all laid out for us. That there's the beginning right the way through to the end. And God says, I'm going to tell you the end right from the beginning. And friends, if all of those things that we've seen were prophesied, and they are now history, they've come to pass, then you can be sure that when the Lord says that he will send his son, when the angel said, ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner.